We are recording. We're recording. So we're recording. We're a little early, but uh, we're rolling, recording, and up to speed. Now, ordinarily, <laughs> I'd be passing out hors d'oeuvres. We'd have some nice yeah. lobster salad sandwiches, uh, <laughs> but but COVID has has killed all that. <laughs> I can't, can't hardly stop. wait for the next real time we have a real no, meeting. Uh, you no could have always shipped the food out, Paul. Anymore. Say again, please. You could, have, you could have shipped the food out to all of us. I <laughs> could have done that. You know, no, why didn't I think of that? What a dummy. Local pizza shop and had it delivered. You know, they're doing that at uh, some businesses are doing that um, for their Zoom meetings. Uh, they, they they call your local pizza shop and they deliver your pizza. You know, it's a lunch and learn thing. Uh, well, fond memories of the post NAB WBZ <laughs> tables of food and the bleacher seats and everything. I miss those so much. You know, Mark, I'd like to catch one of those Pepper's Ghost shows uh, one of these days. And a lot of people that have seen it, they said, "Wow, they really enjoyed it." You know, it See, uh, I think one of them was with a famous woman opera star. I forget who it was. Maria Callas. Ah, yeah. yeah nice penguins, too. Well. <laughs> well, let's see. We're almost there. I'm gonna, I want to give people a chance to come, come aboard here. Uh -huh. Hope we get a few more. Because... Uh, this will be available on demand later, so you know the actual viewership will probably be much higher. We like to think so, anyway. <laughs> I, I want to see if uh, Mark recognizes the penguins in the picture here. No. <laughs> there I see Tim Arthur's picture. Are you there, Tim? Oh, he's, he's, he, oh, there we go. <laughs> how are you, Marty? Good, how are you? Good, good. Good, good. Good to see you, Tim. Good to see good you, see too. You. I have I have video gaming chaos in the background, so I'll, I've been uh, keeping myself muted. <laughs> we love the out of focus thing. That's pretty neat. Yeah, it's one of Zoom's new filters, uh, at least in whatever version we're on, that blurs your background. So the messy office is hidden. Good idea. Sometimes they need to be blurring the foreground. Well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's actually semi-convincing that that uh, yeah the uh, the blurred background. Couple of minutes. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, Windows tried updating my computer for some reason, and for a while it was giving me messages that um, I needed to put my phone number mm -hmm. in and stuff like that. So maybe other really? people are going through this too. I don't know. Yeah, I got hit with a you know security. Do you really want to let no. this website take take charge? And <laughs> I get that every time. Every time. Oh my god. Yes. What's really, what's really weird is I have never been anything but a Mac person, and I get emails telling me I need to update my Windows all the time. Yeah, yeah. So you know where that's coming from. Just are wait the, for the phone the for Mac the phone calls. More virus free. What's is that? The, are the Macs still more virus free? As a former, I don't know. Maybe a Apple little person, bit. Yes. I haven't. I've yeah. never had a virus, so. I mean, in the old days, you used to say, oh, get a Mac and you, you won't get a virus. You know? Well, that's because people didn't want to be bothered writing viruses for something that had such a small user base. So as a six and a half year veteran of Apple, the reason is Apple builds or Intel was building the processor chip right. specifically to Apple spec for a specific motherboard. Uh -huh. Apple builds the motherboards, Apple builds the USB, Apple builds all the rest of the components. So it's a homogeneous environment from Apple. Right. Right. And then and, they put the operating system on top of it. So, geez, secure. And this, now Apple's so developed its own um, chips to Intel outmode now? the Intel's. That's mm -hmm. the M1 chip. And that's going to be taking over everything. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same with the iPhones. And Mark, Android, I, all the different parts. Minute are, is, it is uh, 1900. For you. <laughs> As timekeeper, Marty, uh, it's my great pleasure to announce it's 7 o'clock. 
It's also seven o'clock. Yes. <laughs> All right, just quickly, what was the name of your boss at computer television? Paul Klein. Paul Klein. I could not think, think of his name. Thank you. Okay, let's roll. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our meeting, uh, SIMPTE New England meeting uh, for the month of April. And um, we're thrilled to have as a guest tonight, Mark Shubin. Uh, he's the technical director at the Met Opera. And um, he's going to tell us all about how opera really started television <laughs> and everything up to how we broadcast TV, all, uh, opera TV all over the world. And uh, it's uh, still in high def, not 4K, or is it 4K now? High def. It's high def, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. I remember the first time I saw it, it uh, I just couldn't believe it. And the sound was something else get it in a theater the sound is just amazing probably better than it is at the met i don't know <laughs> it is you can hear every word it's fabulous um maybe he'll tell us too about how he mics it which is which is pretty interesting um so opera actually has a, a history that goes way 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 back uh, with television and and actually uh, Mark says it's responsible for things like newscasts and sportscasts and, and everything else. So Mark, Mark, how long have you been at the Met? I've been at the Met since 73. Wow. <laughs> started working in opera a year before that and started working in television five years before that. Now, some of you may know that, that uh, Mark also directed Sesame Street. And how, lo how long did that go? Uh, I was engineer in charge at Sesame Street for 15 seasons, I think. Wow. Wow. 15 seasons. That's amazing. Uh, and you are also a Simpty fellow, which yes. you should be. You should be a double fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, I'm going to turn it over to you now, and I'm going to be taking notes. Just let you know. There we go. Mark Shubin. Thank you, Marty. And let me get set up for sharing here. Uh, let's see. Okay. You should be seeing my first slide. That looks sharp as a tack. Beautiful. I see uh, nodding, so I know that that's working. Okay, let me just clarify one thing. I have been working at the Metropolitan Opera since 1972. Haven't missed a year yet, um, but I have never worked for the Metropolitan Opera in the sense of being an employee. I have always been freelance, so I do feel kind of possessive about stuff, and I may use pronouns like we and our, but any information that I'm providing about the Met it is stuff that's totally publicly available. Um, also, uh, there's a PDF of these slides already available at bit.ly slash SNE, as in Simpty New England, hyphen opera, because uh, I'll be going through stuff fairly quickly and uh, don't worry about taking notes from the screen. Everything is already available. Also, there was that strange little symbol at the bottom right. Some of you may be familiar with the flag of New England. This was adopted by the New England Governor's Conference in 1988. And the reason I have this here is to point out things that are specific to New England. Okay, this is our program tonight. We're gonna start with what opera is and then act one, uh, the technologies that were available at the time the first opera ticket was sold in 1637, uh, technologies for opera performance, technologies to reach beyond the opera house, and the pandemic and what it inspired in opera. And this beautiful opera house that you're seeing here is the Mariinsky Opera House in St. Petersburg, Russia. Okay, the overture. What is opera? The simple answer is, I don't know, but I do know a little bit. Uh, it's a form of musical theater, but showboat is a form of musical theater and opera is not showboat and showboat is not opera. So what's the difference between the two of them? I wish I could even rely on Justice Potter Stewart's principle of uh, I know pornography when I see it, 
but I don't know opera when I see it. And frankly, I don't think anybody does. So here are four operas that are performed frequently in opera houses, Carmen, um, Bizet's Carmen, Mozart's The Magic Flute, Strauss's The Flatermouse, and Wagner's Parsifal. And opera experts will tell you that each of those four is actually not an opera. Um, the Carmen, it says, is an opera comique. Uh, that sounds like a comic opera. It's not a comic opera. Opera comique means an opera that has unsung words in it. Similarly, Magic Flute, a singspiel. Similarly, the Flatermouse, an operetta. And Parsifal, Wagner, Wagner himself uh, said it was a play for the consecration of the festival. So what is opera? Well, the Latin word opus means work and opera is the plural of that and it means works. And it's works because they're singing and instrumental music and storytelling and acting and visual arts and stagecraft and dancing and so on. Uh, Samuel Johnson called it exotic and irrational entertainment. And it's not cheap because it has all that. Uh, so here's something attributed to Moliere, of all the noises known to man, opera is the most expensive. Uh, when was the first opera? Well, since we don't know what an opera is, it's hard to say that. Galileo's father wrote what's considered the first opera book in 1581, and he said, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks were doing it. There's something that's called a proto-opera that appeared at the beginning of the 13th century, Ludus Danielis. Um, Poliziano wrote something called the Fable of Orfeo in round 18, uh, sorry, 1480, and um, that was said to be opera before opera and Leonardo da Vinci designed stage machinery for it. And some people say the first opera was Daphne in uh, 1597 and 1598. Uh, the difference in the years is not that we don't know when it was, it's that in Florence where it was performed, it was 1597 and in the rest of the world, it was 1598 at the same time. But we do know that the first ticket selling opera house opened in 1637. Now, before we sold tickets to opera, it didn't matter how much it cost. It was a rich person putting it on and the rich person just uh, paid whatever it took. But uh, once it became a commercial enterprise, it somehow had to support itself. So one thing they came up with was boxes that they could rent and sell to the rich. They also had a very large size. Some people say this first ticket selling opera house had a capacity of 6,000. That's 2,000 more than the Metropolitan Opera House, which is the largest in North America. And um, the word, a word that was used in Italian for opera was melodrama. That's mellow as in melody and drama as in theater. So it means musical theater. And that became our word melodrama in English, which means over the top gestures and so on. Well, how did we get from musical theater to over the top gestures? Well, if you have an opera house with 6,000 people to reach the people in the top tier of the opera house, you have to really do over the top gestures. And they even thought at that time that they needed sound ducts because the opera houses were so big that that would be the way to get the uh, music up there. So opera was always looking to increase revenues and reduce expenses. Act one, all the media technologies that were around at the time the first opera ticket was sold. Well, there was a symbiotic relationship between opera and new media. What new media could get from opera was prestige, you know, say, oh, I um, do my medium at the Metropolitan Opera and funding and stories, characters, and stars that people knew about and existing opera audiences. Meanwhile, opera gets from new media, reduced expenses, new audiences, and new revenue streams. So what media existed in 1637? Well, there were books. Um, there was, believe it or not, motion picture projection. Believe it or not, there was automated music playback and automata. So let's examine some of those in detail. On the left is the libretto of that first opera in Florence in 1598. And it was a gift. It, the opera was uh, done at a nobleman's house. And so he gave everybody a party favor at the end, a, a book that had the poetry in it. And I've actually held this book in my hand and it feels like it was printed yesterday. 
It's in absolutely top-notch condition. The printing is wonderful. The paper is wonderful. No deterioration whatsoever in uh, more than 400 years. But then when opera started to become commercial, he said, hmm, maybe I can make some money out of selling this. So here's the same opera, same libretto, but this time it's for sale. So it's on cheaper paper and you can see it looks crummy even already before opening it. Um, but then Handel came up with an additional opera um, revenue stream. He was doing operas in London and he was doing Italian operas and not everyone in London spoke Italian. And so he provided a book that had the uh, words in Italian on one side and the words in English on the other side. But to read the book, he needed a light source. So he also sold you candles. And the people in the opera house didn't always like the candles being lit. And so they would spit at them and try to put them out. By 1727, we have motion image projection on stage. Now, what kind of motion image? Well, the projector is what you see on the left. It's a magic lantern projector. And then there are slides that you see in the, the middle there. And the slides could have a crank on them. And as you crank the slides, you could get a motion effect. So um, that skyline of London that you're seeing in the background was actually projected for that opera. It was projected scenery in 1727. Here's an automaton that was given to uh, Marie Antoinette in 1784. She didn't really like it because it looked too much like her, so she gave it to the Academy of Sciences, which is why we can see it today. But it played eight different opera tunes that were written by Gluck. And down at the bottom, you can see a repinnable barrel for a musical device from around 1480, uh, pretty much the same time as Poliziano's Orfeo. And this is way before the Jacquard loom. So people who think of the Jacquard loom as the first programmable device, they're pretty far off base. Now for the less well healed, there were these things called serenettes that were sort of uh, advanced music boxes. And for the uh, extremely less well healed, there were in fact music boxes. So we had actually opera playback before there was opera recording, but it turns out it wasn't that far before opera recording, as I'll get to pretty soon. Um, but people were very familiar with opera music, it didn't cost very much to get this stuff. And then here's a proposal. The written proposal first came out in 1670, and this pictorial version came out in 1673 of getting the music out of the opera house to others, but he couldn't figure out how to make any money out of this one. Uh, just having it come out outside the house, people could hear and not have to pay anything. But here's the first proposal for subscription home entertainment. This was in 1787. And he's proposing that the opera be delivered by pipes. And you would just open a flap in your home and you could have the opera music come into your room. And since this is a Simti event, I thought I'd mention the Simti honor roll. This is Simti's most exclusive society. Um, and um, these seven people who are in the Simti honor roll all worked on opera projects. Uh, Harvey Fletcher, I'll point out, this is the image at the uh, bottom. Um, he's sitting next to Leopold Stokowski and he came up with a mixing system that you could adjust to make the soprano seem really loud. One description was the soprano was like the Statue of Liberty. 
Um, and so naturally, Stokowski uh, cranked everything up to 11 the first time this was done. And on a broadcast on NBC, it all over modulated. So what he actually has in front of him now that he's adjusting the dials on is the placebo. It doesn't do anything. <laughs> Okay, now some technologies for opera performance. Uh, these are three covers of Scientific American, all of them featuring the Metropolitan Opera in 1888, 1897, and 1904, because the stage technology was so amazing. The first one on the left, 1888, they're showing how electricity was used so they could have a sword fight on stage and sparks would fly every time the swords touched one another. Um, here's the, maybe the first opera engineer, uh, Giacomo Torelli, and he came up with an amazing system for counterweighted pole and chariot scene changing. So one person could do a complete scene change in full view of the audience. And I'll demonstrate in the moment something like what the effect looked like, except the one that I'm going to demonstrate didn't have the counterweight. So you'll see six people pushing on it to make it happen. And a great last name. Yeah. The ropes being pulled are for a thunder box. Crash! Crash! It's full of rocks. So that place was built in 1766, and they're still doing operas today with the same stage machinery. Um, but let me talk a little bit about lighting. There's a 1638 remote-controlled lighting dimmer for an opera house, and on the right is a color changer. And uh, you could have different bottles with different colors, so you could actually change color in the middle. This is actually the lighting system in the Drottning Home Court Theater, which you just saw. And that big wheel that you see in the kind of middle, uh, that was the lighting control. The one concession they've made to the 21st century is instead of using candles now, they use a fiber optic system that delivers the light of one candle to each place where the candles used to be. But there's a professor who did a computer simulation of what the lighting effects could have looked like at the time a place like this opened, and here's what it is. That's all candles and mechanical control. But what about the audience lighting? Well, we have this opera house, and it's very large now. Before the 19th century, wicks were not consumed on candles, and so they had to be trimmed. Now, for candles that were backstage, the stagehands could trim the wicks, and for candles that were on stage, the performers could trim the wicks, like with a fancy pair of snuffers, as you see there. And for um, candles in the sconces, you could have footmen walking through the theater and trimming those. But if it's a big opera house, you need a chandelier. And how do you trim the candles on a chandelier? You can't, you'd have to erect a ladder in the middle of the audience in the middle of the opera and that's not going to work. 
So here's the report from March of 1683. Someone's talking about the festival in Venice and he talks about the theater that he went into and he said, just before the opera started, the ceiling opened up and the chandelier went up into the ceiling where the stage hands could extinguish the candles and trim the wicks and so on. And then just before the end of the opera or just after the end of the opera, the ceiling opened up again and the chandelier came down fully lit and provided exit lighting. And I'll get to some more exit lighting later. In 1849, we start dealing with electricity. So here's an arc light effect that was used for a sunrise in the opera Le Prophète. And the person who did it was Jules Dubosc, who was the head of special effects for the Paris Opera. Uh, not only did he come up with the electrical effect, but remember no power company in 1849. So he has to come up with the batteries to make the power and the batteries are wet cells and they're generating toxic fumes. So he also comes, has to come up with a system to cleanse the air of the toxic fumes so he doesn't kill everyone in the opera house. He also came up with a rainbow effect an illuminated fountain using the total internal reflection principle that's used in fiber optics. And he was awarded the first photographic sequential motion picture patent in 1852. And it happened to be in stereoscopic 3D as well. Um, so the first place that had electric lighting in a, an opera house, regular electric lighting, not arcs, was uh, in Paris as a test. And then the Savoy Theater in London and of course they used in-house generators and there were in-house generators used from Brno to Rio. In Boston, the Bijou Theater was the first in the United States to be lit uh, by electricity. It was an opera house and they had their own generators and they took a production from the Savoy Theater in London. And so they uh, took the generators also from the Savoy Theater in London. And so we get to this strange thing where the head of the radiology department at the Children's Hospital in Boston says, no opera, no x-rays. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Children's Hospital had an x-ray machine. The x-ray machine needs electric power. There's no electric company, remember? So they run a line from the hospital to the opera house to use the generators that the opera house had, but the generators at the opera house only ran when they were doing an opera, so no opera, no x-rays. The lighting grid first installed at the Amsterdam Opera House in New York. And these are images from a, uh, an article in the transactions of the Society of Motion Picture Engineers. And operas for movies, uh, sorry, movies for opera scenery. This was something that uh, in France, after you got a patent, you were supposed to get it certified by some important person. So this is the secretary of the Paris Opera certifying that Louis Le Prince's um, movie system was a method and apparatus for the projection of animation uh, in view of adaptation to operatic scenes. Mm -hmm. Current projection, this is stuff from the Met, um, at the top right, you can see uh, an image from the damnation of Faust and you see a gondola and the gondola is going through the water and you can see the ripples in the water. Well, there's no water there. That's all projection. And the projection is being distorted uh, in real time. So wherever the gondola is, whatever is happening with the pole, you're seeing that in the reflection. And down at the bottom left, you see an image from uh, Siegfried and um, this is projection onto what's called the machine, which is uh, 45 tons of 24 planks that can rotate 360 degrees. So the projectors are having to warp the image so that it matches the plank, whatever is happening to it. And they're also selecting different depth planes. So if the plank is rotating, it looks like it's in three dimensions. It'll pick out whatever depth plane is appropriate. Mm. And, I'm sorry. Question? No. Uh, Kurt Weill incorporated media into his operas. The first was a, an opera called Royal Palace. He incorporated a movie to advance the plot. And that same thing was more famously adopted uh, in Alban Berg's uh, opera Lulu, which had a film interlude. You see an image from that there. In 1928, Weill, for an opera called The Tsar Has His Photograph Taken, uh, introduced phonograph recordings that were meant to be played. So there was a practical phonograph that would play music. 
And in 1930, he had a loudspeaker in the rise and fall of the city of Mahagoni. Even earlier sound, the laryngoscope uh, was actually invented by an opera baritone, Manuel Garcia. He wanted to see how people sang, and so he invented the laryngoscope. And the first aria recording was actually made in 1860, and this is 17 years before Edison's phonograph. Um, the recording was sort of that strip of lines that you see there. Uh, wasn't able to be played back until the 21st century when we had good enough technology, but then they were able to play it back and you can hear this aria from 1860. In 1901, there were study recordings and they became so popular that uh, they've been issued as the Mapleson cylinders. Lionel Mapleson was the person who recorded them. In 1903, there was assisted listening for the hearing impaired at the Met. And in 1908, surveillance audio, so the general manager could hear what was going on on stage. And synthesized music. This is a 200 ton machine built in Holyoke um, with an alternator per sine wave. So it generated huge amounts of power, uh, but it created opera music and Lee the Forest broadcast it. And up here in Boston, uh, Countdown was an opera that was commissioned by Boston Lyric Opera. It was the first live virtual orchestra, the first computer computer assisted composition, and uh, later became the first audio streaming. Non living performers, there were puppets used for opera at least by 1647, uh, but there are two US patents for puppets specifically for opera, and they're amazing puppets. The image you see at the right is uh, Joe Olive at Bell Labs, who wrote an opera for a synthesized singing voice. And in 2010, again, the New England flag, because it's at the MIT Media Labs Opera of the Future, Todd Macover wrote uh, Death and the Powers, which used something called emotion capture. Not just motion capture, but you could capture the emotion of the singers and transfer it to a non-anthropomorphic device like a chandelier. Uh, titles has always been an issue. I mentioned that Handel came up with the libretto in English and Italian. Well, uh, there's a patent in the UK in 1881 for projecting patents and it sort of anticipates the teleprompter. Live from Lincoln Center had the first live titles on television, the first live titles in opera houses uh, in 1983, at first at Canadian Opera Company and then New York City Opera. Uh, the Met has title system on the back of each seat, multilingual titles by 2007, and now back of each seat in Santa Fe has pictorial systems. So you can have really fancy titles rather than simple dot matrix. And then here's on-site opera, a very small company in New York that does things that, that are site specific. So they're doing the opera Pygmalion in a mannequin show, uh, show house here. And uh, they're using Google Glass for titles. So if people sing behind you, you can turn your head and still see the titles as you're watching the singers. And then in San Francisco and Houston, image magnification. If you're way up in the highest balcony, you can see what's going on on stage and also see the titles there. Okay, how about technologies to reach beyond the opera house? This is the music that you see at the upper right being played by Joyce Castle, an opera singer and teacher. So what's so special about that? Well, that piece of sheet music that you're looking at was actually faxed in 1860, January 22nd, 1860, by the opera composer Gioacchino Rossini uh, in honor of his friend Giovanni Caselli, who invented the fax machine that he used called the pan telegraph. Even before that, parliamentary news was sent by telegraph to London's Royal Italian Opera House. So if members of parliament were needed for a vote, they would know that they should go back. And then in 1885, the telegraph was used to deliver plays from a remote baseball game to an opera house. Now, why opera house? Because they were big. There was an expense in having the telegraph operators and so on, uh, but this certainly grew very quickly. There were 44 US patents that were issued for display systems for these remote baseball viewing systems that were done in opera houses. 
Uh, the one at the upper left was uh, done by um, Frank Chapman, who was a singer in New York. And this was something that one person could do to reproduce the opera. At the right, you see the Electra score, and that had 1,500 light bulbs that could show you the arc of the ball. And then the lower left is um, Coleman's lifelike scoreboard, 400 projectors, including a moving projector. And you can see one of the systems, there's actually a movie from 1919 that's showing you can see the, the runner going to first base, the ball being thrown to the pitcher and so on. Um, live sound distribution. It, well, we had that first proposal in 1787. You may be familiar with the physicist Charles Wheatstone, Wheatstone Bridge and so on. He came up with a system for hanging a heavy metal lute from a wire connected to the soundboard of an instrument. And then the sound would emanate from the lute and people thought, oh, we can get sound by wire. So even before Bell, the New York Times predicted that the opera would be delivered uh, to your home. In 1877, Bell demonstrated long distance by sending an aria from Providence to Boston. Uh, complete opera was transmitted in Bellinzona, Switzerland in 1878. Uh, operas were sent to homes in the UK and the US in 1880. In stereo, that's the diagram at the bottom right, at the first electricity congress in 1881, the phone company did toll charges for delivering opera in 1882, and there was a subscription service in Lisbon starting in 1885. And the parabolic opera was invented in 1887 in Rome for uh, one of these opera by telephone services. More commercial service in Madrid in 1885, they decided to put in an opera by phone service, but there were only 80 people who had telephones in the whole city of Madrid. So they said, oh, okay, we'll put in some listening rooms that people can go to so they can listen to the opera by telephone. In Paris, there was a commercial service. That's what the um, poster is for and a home service. And Marcel Proust subscribed. In Budapest, they had this service and it was delivering opera, but the opera didn't start until 8 p.m. So they said, hmm, what can we do with the lines before 8 p.m.? I know, we'll have people read the news. And so they created what was effectively uh, the first radio station, including newscasts, the telephone near Mondo. And in Brussels, uh, someone decided to do something very similar to what was done in Paris and um, Verdi got wind of it. They actually paid for the rights to present one of Verdi's operas in a hall, but they didn't pay for the rights to send it by telephone to an electricity congress. And so Verdi sued them and established broadcast rights by winning the lawsuit. Radio, uh, we think of KDKA as the first radio station. Ha, uh, 1907, which is 13 years before KDKA, uh, Lee de Forest started transmitting opera stuff in 1910. There were operas transmitted directly from the roof of the Metropolitan Opera. Um, opera was transmitted more than 2,000 miles in 1919. 1920, transatlantic and beyond. Uh, there were stereo broadcasts in Berlin starting in 1925. And uh, radio opera commissions, including a non-visual opera because it used sound effects. The first edited program on radio was an opera. The first stereo network was for opera. And uh, opera got its own satellite channel in 2007. So what about live video? Well, the oldest publication of any sort in any language about what we call today television was in 1877. And it pretty much describes what I do. It says that it would be possible to represent on 100 stages in various parts of the world the opera sung in any given theater. Uh, in 1878, there was a publication in Polish that was actually uh, useful. It said, you know, this is what you have to do to transmit opera. And Edison had a proposal for doing color TV in 1891 for opera. Here was a spoof in 1881 uh, showing people watching opera, but it looks pretty much like what you might see today for people watching opera at home, except for holding the telephone receivers to the ears. 
And here's another prediction of Opera TV in 1882. Uh, this was published in French in 1882. The first English translation wasn't published until 2004 by Wesleyan University Press. And it predicts not only Opera on TV, but broadcasting newscasts, product placement, and all based on the 1881 Paris Opera demonstrations in stereo. Now, here's that New York Times story in 1876 saying that by telephone, you're definitely going to listen to the opera at home. Um, but phonograph, they didn't think was useful for music. They said, ah, you know, you can record a sermon and keep it in the basement. Um, and even Edison said the main utility of the phonograph was going to be for letter writing. But then an opera star recorded an aria on the phonograph and suddenly that became the image that everyone used to um, describe the phonograph. But recording, it's not live and it's too short. So it doesn't seem really appropriate for opera. Um, early cylinders and discs were limited to two minutes and that eventually got up to four minutes. Uh, it didn't seem like a commercial enterprise at all. The first bootleg recording, interestingly, was opera in 1888. Someone wanted to get this opera for his regional company, couldn't get the rights for it, so sneaked into a New York theater that was doing it and tried to record it on a phonograph, but was caught. Here's accidental stereo. When you're recording cylinders, you couldn't stamp them out, and so it was good to have as many recorders as you possibly could each time you were making a recording. But that meant that if you can find two cylinders that were recorded at the same session, you can get stereo. So Victor bet on opera. Uh, now you're probably familiar with Victor from RCA Victor at least, the Victor Talking Machine Company. Um, you know why they were called Victor. Well, it's because everyone sued them because they had the best technology and so they wanted to delay them and they won all of the lawsuits. And at the end of winning all the lawsuits, took them about 13 years, um, they you know, congratulated themselves and said, uh, well, we won the last lawsuit. Okay, let's call ourselves Victor. But it was kind of a Pyrrhic victory because Edison had this great head start. And so they decided to bet the company on opera. And they erected the world's largest illuminated sign. They had this book that they would give out to everyone. And the idea was, if you bought an opera record, then you were part of the opera class. And that's what made uh, Enrico Caruso's recording of Vesti La Juba the earliest recorded million seller. So Edison then had to fight back because Victor uh, took over from Edison. So when Edison switched over from cylinders to disc, he arranged these things called tone tests. And he would do something like go into Carnegie Hall and uh, have a singer and a phonograph on stage. And the singer would start singing and the lights would go out and the singing would continue and the lights came back on. Uh, there wouldn't be the singer on stage, only the phonograph. And it was, ah! You know, couldn't tell the difference. Well, couldn't tell the difference from a 78 RPM scratchy recording. Um, well, yeah, because, you know, it's like that story of it isn't so much what the dog says, it's the fact that he can talk at all. Uh, people weren't accustomed to having uh, something reproduced. But Anna Case, who is a Metropolitan Opera soprano, who was one of the most popular singers in the tone tests, confessed in 1972 that she trained herself to sound like a phonograph recording of herself. Hmm. So here's Enrico Caruso in a um, self-portrait singing into a recording horn, and that horn is introducing all kinds of acoustic distortion. So is there a way to deal with that? Yes, Tom Stockham, who you may know, uh, he was a winner of Emmy Award, Grammy Award, and Oscar. Uh, he did blind deconvolution to get rid of the horn distortion and let us hear what Enrico Caruso sounded like. Also in 1976, he did the first commercial digital recordings and they were opera. Uh, Thomas Edison filed his first patent caveat for movies in 1888 and he had only one purpose for them. He said, a continuous opera. There's no other reason to have movies. We may see and hear a whole opera as perfectly as if actually present. 
So silent movies uh, were very favorable to opera. At the bottom right, you see an image from Cecil B. DeMille's um, silent movie of Carmen in 1915. And who's playing Carmen? It's Geraldine Farrar, a famous opera soprano. She has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, one for being a movie star and one for being an opera star. Um, as movies got longer, they would have local sound. There would be musicians in the theater. They used opera stories because they were known. They used opera singers because they were already stars. Um, so how did they get that music? Well, for the opera Martha, they had singers standing behind the screen. For the assassination of the Duc de Guise in 1908, uh, they had the first film score and it was written by opera composer Camille Sanson. And when the Academy Awards came around, the first two Academy Awards for film scores went to opera composer Eric Wolfgang Korngold. Um, and then there's this thing called a film opera, Rhapsodia Satanica in 1915. Why is it called a film opera? I'm not sure, but it had a libretto. So for cueing the musicians in the movie theaters, you see that rhombus at the top of the column there, it would light up different bars to indicate who should sing or play at what time in this movie. In this movie, there's an image of the conductor down at the bottom. And in this movie, there's an actual musical score that's going backwards and the singers would be behind the screen and they could watch the score. That's uh, the oldest existing sound movie, uh, but it wasn't properly synchronized until the 21st century. Um, but if we could have sync sound, why didn't it continue? Well, there were no amplifiers and uh, you could have live musicians versus canned sound. Live musicians sound better than what you just heard. Here's the founder of our society, Charles Francis Jenkins. And he wrote a book on vision by radio and why should a television set have a loudspeaker so that an entire opera in both action and music can be received. This is the earliest TV show with an original script anywhere. And it's an operetta called Their Television Honeymoon that was broadcast in Chicago. Um, there were video recordings too. Here's an off-air recording, an, a bare disc of Betty Bolton singing sometime in 1932 to 35 on bared phonovision, restored by Don McLean. So television opera, the first proposal for a conductor camera so people could watch the conductor and not have to uh, keep looking at him was in 1928 by the conductor Fritz Reiner. Uh, it's kind of a good idea that it didn't happen. I'll explain that in a moment. In 1934, the opera Carmen was broadcast at BBC. That's the Carmen on the right there, Sarah Fisher. Uh, there were full length operas starting in 1937. Uh, there were operas broadcast from the Opera House stage starting in 1940, uh, sorry, 1937 was the other, 1947 from the Opera House stage. And just as there was an unstageable radio opera with sound effects, there was an unstageable video opera, Labyrinth, with video effects. And uh, HDTV in 1989, way before anyone else was doing stuff. And uh, UHD 4K starting in 2014 with user selectable views. So here's why that uh, conductor camera in 1928 wasn't such a good idea. Television in those days was using a flying spot scanner. And so the studio was dark. And so here's a musician who says, oh, no problem. Uh, I'll just print the music in radium on black paper and everyone will be able to see it. Here's commercial TV in the US uh, doing opera. And um, you can see all of the uh, various networks doing things, including Dumont. And ABC did opening nights at the Met. And they put dry ice on the cameras so they could turn off the fans. And they had infrared lighting on the stage so that they could augment the lighting without it being too bright for the people who were in the audience. Uh, Color TV, after that Edison proposal in 1891, 
the first NTSC color broadcast that was viewed at home was Carmen in 1953. And before that, the quote, first publicly announced experimental broadcasting compatible color TV of a network program was Kukla Fran and Ollie's St. George and the Dragon, which actually premiered in Boston with uh, Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. Geosynchronous satellites are uh, very useful to us. They have done TV opera delivery since 1976 and non-geosynchronous since 1967. They were proposed by science fiction author Arthur C. Clarke, but the basis of it was Kepler's third law of planetary motion in 1619. Now Kepler published the first two laws by 1609, but not that third law. In 1917, he found out that his mother was accused of witchcraft and he went to defend her. He was a lawyer besides everything else. Um, he lost and she was convicted of witchcraft, but her punishment was to be threatened with torture, not to actually have torture done to her. So she was fine. She didn't care about being threatened. But right after that, he published the third law in 1619. So where did he get the third law idea? Well, the book that he read on the way to defend his mother was Galileo's father's book on opera. And he credits Galileo's father with giving him the ideas for the third law of planetary motion. There was a semi-live cinema proposal by Hugo Gernsback in 1919. He said, okay, um, let's have a movie shot of an opera and we'll distribute the film around the country. And then we'll have the singers sing into microphones and distribute that by radio around the country at the same time the film is being shown. So it's kind of a semi-live proposal. But live cinema began with the Met in 1952, 31 cinemas in 27 cities, but it was low definition, black and white, less than AM quality sound. Um, there were about 60,000 seats sold and it was $60 top ticket. Uh, but why was it rated highly with that kind of low quality? Well, for one thing, there's group mentality. If there's any problems, if no one else complains, why should I? People would applaud in the movie theaters, even though no one could see or hear them applauding. And then there's cognitive dissonance. If you paid $60 for a ticket to see this opera and you spent time and effort to get there, if it was bad, then you were stupid and you don't wanna be stupid. Therefore, it must've been good. There was also free community TV starting in a uh, plaza in Basel, Switzerland. And then uh, the Metropolitan Opera would do things on its plaza as well as in Times Square. And San Francisco Opera started doing it in ballparks, AT&T Park with the opera shown on the LED screen that was later increased in Washington. The first one in Washington was an opera called Nbalo and Mascara. So at the beginning, uh, umpire came out on the field and shouted, play Balo! A <laughs> um, little bit about visual and oral positions. We have some cameras that are in the back of the house, some cameras that are near, and you can see that the visual perspective changes greatly, but we can't change the oral perspective to match that. And the oral perspective can even switch stereo sides if someone takes a step forward and someone else takes a step backward. Uh, also, let's say there's a sunset happening. So we have a tremendous amount of orange light coming from one side of the stage and a tremendous amount of blue light coming from the other side of the stage. Well, if we switch from the left camera to the right camera, how do we deal with that? So uh, tricky stuff. There's also cinema sizes. Here's a small movie theater. And here's a large one. This is the largest one that the Met goes to. It's in Mexico City, Auditorio Nacional, and it has a capacity of 10,000. Now, again, the Metropolitan Opera House has a capacity of only 4,000. So if you're in the far balcony, you're a, a great distance away from the screen. Um, well, we are accustomed to delayed sound being okay. You go to a rally or something and you're far away, you hear the sound later than it's coming out, that's fine. But when you see a close up, you don't want the sound to be delayed. You want the sound to be right there. So another problem, we sometimes get calls from theaters, people saying, the sound is out of sync. Oh, wait till a wide shot. Oh yeah, you're right, it's back in sync. For doing sync tests, 
uh, there's a valid um, test signal on the left, the video audio lineup and ID, you may be familiar with that, but projectionists are not engineers and so they don't necessarily have a valid decoder, so we use a clack stick and that's how they tell sync. Also, because projectionists might be dealing in a multiplex with say 16 auditoriums where different things are happening, they might not know when the opera is over. So we create our own exit lighting by transmitting this for the last 10 minutes. Okay, the pandemic and uh, what it inspired. So opera just before the pandemic, this is from Opera America's 2020 annual field report. Uh, which covers about 76% of the um, companies that are members of uh, Opera America. 114 US cities have professional opera companies. Professional companies are ones that pay the singers. 28% um, of the operas performed in the 2018-19 season were actually written after 1970. And some more recent innovations, the IBC gave a special award to the Vienna State Opera in 2014 for 4K streaming with user selectable views and a synchronized score. And there was also a global interactive chandelier control at Dallas Opera's Death and the Powers. I was actually at that performance and I didn't even notice that the chandelier was going up and down. Um, opera on Tap did a virtual reality opera in 2016, uh, composed by Kamala Shankaram, uh, called the Parksville Murders. And Experiments in Opera did another Kamala Shankaram opera called Looking at You, which had data mining. And uh, they asked me when I bought a ticket if I was willing to let them look for information about me just based on my email address. And I said, sure. And in the middle of the opera, I saw pictures of me projected on the screen. So data mining was kind of interesting. So here comes the pandemic and uh, they're saying that uh, companies lost an average of 24% of their operating budgets and only 19% of the program that they actually put on in 2020, 2021 was scheduled originally there. Uh, 15,135 canceled op, uh, artist contracts. So they had to do something to stay alive. Now, why was opera worse off than other people? Well, for one thing, it's got loud singing. This is the Metropolitan Opera House and it's uh, something like 200 feet from the farthest place a singer could be to the farthest place an audience member could be. Uh, so that's a lot of blasting out of singing. The stage is crowded, the orchestra pit is crammed with people, a lot of whom are playing instruments with their mouths. There's huge capacities and the audience tends to slew older. So in an intermission, when everyone rushes to the restroom, that could be a super spreader event and long durations. So what do I mean by a lot of people on stage? This is shooting the movie, This is Cinerama at La Scala Opera House in Milan. And you can see not only all the people on stage already, but the people who are coming onto stage from there. So in Barcelona during the pandemic, they didn't trust having anyone in the opera house. So they had a concert for plants. Every seat was occupied by a plant and then they gave the plants to uh, medical personnel afterwards. In Madrid, they did try doing opera and a lot of people got sick, but they kept trying. This is this week at the uh, Real Madrid Opera House in uh, Teatro uh, Real, rather, in Madrid. And there's the ushers, and they have their gloves and their face shields and their masks. Uh, opera Lafayette did sort of what the NBA did uh, and created a bubble. So they flew out all of the singers to a ranch in Colorado, had them quarantined for two weeks, and then they could perform together, but they performed outdoors, and the audience sat on hay bales. Uh, with social distancing. San Diego and English National Opera had drive-in opera. And so they transmitted the sound to your car radio with an FM transmitter and giant screens for watching the opera. Uh, in Tulsa Opera, there's a giant screen, but it's at the uh, baseball stadium. And they kind of rejiggered the opera Rigoletto so it could be socially distanced and it was outdoors and very few people were admitted. In Paris, they decided to use puppets for intimate scenes 
and only the principals didn't wear masks. In Atlanta, uh, they had a big tent outdoors with isolation booths and puppets and your ticket, your e-ticket was on your smartphone and it came with a uh, health check-in where you had to answer a questionnaire. Um, this is a small opera company called Opera on Tap and over the holiday season, Christmas and New Year's, they came up with these Zoom bomb ideas where you pay money to have an opera singer uh, bomb your Zoom uh, and um, 75 bucks. And so they figured, oh, we'll repeat it for Mother's Day. Um, the English National Opera is helping COVID-19 patients learn to breathe again. They have courses to help the, the long haulers and various opera companies. This happens to be Opera San Jose down at the bottom, but Glamourglass Festival is another one, had their costume departments make masks. And here are two women who were friends. They were volunteers at a museum in New York, and they used to go to the opera. And when the Metropolitan Opera shut down last March, uh, that's March of 2020, not 2021, um, they didn't know what to do. But the Met started offering a different free streamed opera every day. So this is a story in January where they've now seen 300 different operas in a row uh, by watching a different stream every day. The Met also did a free at-home gala from around the world, and um, their joint performances are different from others in that they begin with the conductor who conducts nobody, but does it exactly the way he wants, and then the concertmaster watches the conductor and plays that on the violin, and then everybody else joins in what the concertmaster is doing, and so it's a much more musical kind of presentation than if it were a click track. Similarly, when they have people around the world uh, who are contributing to the gala. They have a director who is looking at all the places that the people have in their house and, okay, that's a good place to do it. Oh, this is the kind of lighting that we need there. And uh, so it's an actual TV show. And then they started doing Met Stars live in concert to raise a little bit money in addition. Um, why do the free stuff? Well, uh, have to keep their name alive. So here's box office versus contributions. And you can see around 2007 or something, contributions really took off. So you want the contributors to know that the Met is still alive, they're still doing opera, they're doing a different opera every week and so on. So what have we been doing? Well, we've been working at home collaboratively. Well, Honoria and Sieber Spazio um, was an opera that was composed collaboratively starting in 1994 um, over the internet. And then we were stuck doing Zoom. And so there's Kamala Shankaram again, that same composer who came up with the data mining opera and the VR opera. And she did the first Zoom opera, but Zoom has varying amounts of latency. And so she had to deal with that. So I highly recommend this uh, link to find out how she dealt with the latency and where people were and so on. This is a company called Onsite Opera, and they went back to the most basic of technologies. They came up with Opera by Phone, and it was a one on one uh, technology. That was the first thing they did. And then Opera by Snail Mail, which sounds ridiculous. Uh, but here's a review in the New York Times, and it says that the stuff that they mailed made the, the music and the words take flight. And now they're about to introduce something uh, that I'm calling Opera by Foot, which is the road we came. And it's actually tours of different sections of New York where you take your smartphone and you listen to music and find out things that were going on there. And then here's that local company for you guys again, White Snake Projects. And uh, they uh, committed to transmedia work. They work with Rhode Island School of Design and Becker College and they've been doing real-time motion capture and 3D modeling and animation. And during the pandemic, um, the uh, creator there and librettist, Cerise Lim Jacobs, came up with a libretto about what was going on for the first responders. And then her team uh, came up with motion capture and computer animation to follow the stuff. Her audio people came up with really low latency stuff. They're still working on stuff. And it was acquired by the Library of Congress for their performing arts COVID-19 response collection. And she's now doing something, sing out strong essential voices. 
And then composer Kamala Shankaram, she was supposed to premiere an opera last summer at Glimmerglass Festival, The Jungle Book, um, but that got canceled. But she did the first Zoom opera again. She did an episodic space opera. She did an opera podcast series and another VR opera, uh, this time with motion capture and live computer graphics based in Binghamton. Um, so she's been as busy as the uh, composers in the height of the opera period. So uh, again, uh, these slides are available at bit.ly slash SNE uh, hyphen opera. And there are more links available at bit.ly slash opera hyphen pandemic, if you are interested in that. And now I will be happy to entertain any questions that anyone has. Yeah, I would like to know when the Met is coming back. Uh, the Met is coming back in September. Um, they will be doing a Verdi Requiem on September 11th in honor of 9-11 uh, uh, or in memory of 9-11. And uh, then the opening night will be uh, Terrence Blanchard's uh, fire uh, caught up in my bones, I think, um, on September 27th. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, hi. My name is Melanie Held, and I'm actually the opera director at Michigan State University. Hi. And so we've been really struggling, of course, over the year, particularly in Michigan, because we had such a bad outbreak. And we've been doing some green screen. Uh, and it turned out to be a lot more expensive and a lot more complicated than we thought it was going to be. Um, and I guess what I'd like to know from the society members is, you know, I think that, that I hope you guys know that the universities are willing to experiment. So if you've got new technologies you want to try out, we're really the place to do it. Um, we don't have a lot of budget, but we have a lot of capability. And um, I th thank you for this lecture. It was fascinating. Uh, you know, I was a singer before I was a director. And so I've been in a lot of those opera houses and it was really, really interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I, I might add to that. Uh, the University of Las Vegas here in Nevada has a really interesting collaboration between their performing arts college and the engineering college. It's an uh, engineering, entertainment, and design. And uh, again, because of all the venues here, they get a chance to you know, play around on the stage with uh, some of this different technology. But what really has me exciting is the MGM Sphere uh, it's supposed to be a virtual reality entertainment thing. And I, I wonder if Mark might comment uh, about uh, uh, some of those uh, virtual reality initiatives and how they, they, they might, uh, in, in fact, interact or overlap with some of what Opera has been doing and might do in the future. Yeah, um, I mentioned that there's that other link to um, the uh, more links about uh, opera and media technology. And one of the links in there is a talk that uh, Kamala Shankaram gave on virtual reality. And it's one of the best talks I've ever heard about virtual reality anywhere. And I've been to many SIMTI conferences and others about it. Um, and she really describes the importance of virtual reality in opera, how you direct with audio. Um, if you want somebody to look to the left, you make a sound to the left and so on. And how you can capture the uh, immersive space of the opera house in the immersive space of VR. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not permitted to comment at all on the sphere um, because of uh, some contractual obligations, uh, but otherwise I would love to. Mark, along a parallel uh, train of thought, volumetric, what do you see the future with volumetric in opera? Yeah, uh, hey, anything that anyone can do, an opera company is going to try it. And I think uh, they will find all of the problems with it and all of the great things about it. Um, it's happened with television, it's happened with radio, it's happened with recordings. You know, as I pointed out, Edison had no conception that recordings would be good for music at all until the opera singer recorded an aria, and then it was suddenly, oh, hey, we can get arias on recordings. What a great thing. Paul, up, oh, you're muted. Uh, 
I there thought I had unmuted. Thank you. The question is in 1961 or 62, I was aware that RCA, um, uh, perhaps directed by General Sarnoff, was trying to do telecasting of live opera or other stage plays. And they were doing it with just three cameras placed in the, in the audience area. Um, and it was 61 or 62. Does that ring a bell with you? Do you know anything of that effort? And it obviously didn't last long. Uh, I'm not familiar with that specific effort. There were um, many broadcasts of operas that happened before that. Uh, three cameras was uh, quite a common configuration. Uh, ABC did opening night at the Met in 1948, and BBC beat them by one year and did uh, an opera from the Cambridge, Cambridge Theatre in London in 1947. Um, Theatre Network Television uh, did that Carmen that you saw that went to the movie theaters in 1952, and then they came back and did more Met things to movie theaters. So uh, alternative content for uh, cinema is an opera development and currently the number one alternative content for cinema anywhere in the world is the Metropolitan Opera Live in HD. And it's followed by uh, Britain's National Theater. Thank Mark, you. it's Gary. Gary, Gary. Uh, excellent update. This is the third time I've seen your talk and this is the best ever. You really updated a lot, which is terrific. Uh, talk a little bit, if you can, about Pat Weaver, Sylvester Weaver, who uh, started that subscription TV plan in the in the 70s. And his view, I remember him telling me one time that uh, uh, he thought more people would see uh, uh, Estrada or something in one night than had seen it in all of history. Yeah, uh, the problem was the subscription part. Um, and you might mention, for people who don't know, Pat Weaver was the uh, big shot at NBC who started the Today Show, the Tonight Show. And a lot yeah, of other maybe more familiar with him as the father of Sigourney Weaver. Susan. Um, but, Her real name is Susan, of course. <laughs> but yeah, talk about talk about the subscription part. Yeah, yeah well, subscription was always the, the tricky part. Um, the Metropolitan Opera tried doing a subscription pay TV thing to homes. Um, and it's one of the only television things that they did that was not successful. Um, a lot of people just didn't want to pay for it. You know, when you can get things for free, then why pay for it? But doing it in the movie theaters, where this, there's this community and you're with other people who are watching the opera and it's kind of like watching in the opera house, that's been tremendously successful. So as I mentioned, the Met Live in HD has, uh, is the number one alternative content anywhere in the world. And of course, the economics of that work because you're already familiar with paying a high fee to see something in the theater. Right as opposed to high fee to see it on a home TV set. Yeah. I have a question. Um, how uh, will the Met compensate for all the movie theaters that have closed in airing the HD opera? Uh, I don't think the Met's gonna be able to do anything for what didn't happen. Um, if you're talking about movie theaters that closed and won't open again, uh, I think the, the main chains are probably gonna come back. Uh, very sad that Arclight says that they can't but um, AMC is back already and uh, other chains around the world are coming back. And uh, you know, they'll, they'll probably find somebody else to take over a theater for the people who said that they couldn't hold out. Mark, has anything changed since you started doing it? Any new equipment or technology? Oh yeah, uh, everything has changed. We. We have uh, changed cameras, we've changed recording, uh, we're doing some stuff in the cloud that we didn't do before. Um, our transmission has changed. Um, there's a few things that have been changed and maybe they're more interesting. Uh, one is that we're doing HD. Someone asked at the beginning if we were doing 4K or HD. Uh, Vienna State Opera is doing 4K because they're going to people's homes. We're doing HD because we're going to movie theaters. And frankly, from most seats in a movie theater, you're not going to really be able to tell the difference between HD and 4K. And um, we'd rather have the additional sensitivity that we get from doing HD. Um, another thing that hasn't changed yet is delivery by satellite. And you'd think, oh, you know, at this point, why not 
just deliver on the internet. Um, well, I don't know if any of you saw the news reports when the pandemic hit, everyone started streaming movies at home and the internet had such a load on it that um, Netflix and Amazon maybe had to reduce their quality so that the internet wouldn't go down. Um, well, we go all around the world. We've actually gone to all seven continents, including Antarctica. And we go to places where the internet reliability just isn't there yet. And so we're still doing satellite. Um, so that hasn't changed. Um, on the basis of our audio producers, and this is up to the audio producer, we have changed much more to body mics than we used to. We used to be much more um, shotgun type mics and hypercardioids, and we're still doing that, but uh, generally now all the principal singers also wear body mics, um, but that's the, the audio producer's choice. Mark, have you transitioned to all robotic cameras or is it still a mix of manually operated it's and robotic? almost entirely, well, even the, the robotic camera is manually operated. There's somebody who's uh, under the stage. We have a, a place that we call Roboland and we uh, typically have three and uh, maybe five um, robotic cameras or remote controlled cameras that are controlled down there. Uh, but generally, each camera has an operator. Sometimes we can get away with two cameras to an operator if one of them is the beauty shot or something like that. Typically, how many cameras are you're, you're using for a, 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 an opera well, performance? Nine or ten for the opera and another two uh, for the interstitial stuff, the opening, the intermissions, stuff like that. Since HD came up a couple of times, um, I'm curious, is it 720, 1080, 24, 30? Are there any changes, decisions being made on that? Uh, there, there are, but they're unfortunately not in my control. Um, <laughs> what's happening is we participate in a um, distribution system in the United States, Fathom Entertainment or National Cinemedia. And um, they started out using sort of conference room projectors, even though they were in movie theaters. Um, and the reason for that was the digital cinema projectors in the movie theaters were amortized by something called a virtual print fee. And if they used the digital cinema projectors, they'd have to pay a virtual print fee, and that would make the economics not that great for uh, doing the opera. So they, they would use these conference room projectors. Now that um, the digital cinema projectors are basically paid off, there's not a virtual print fee issue anymore. And so maybe things will change, but at the moment we are contractually obligated to deliver to them um, 1080i, 2997. Uh, we do, however, do a conversion, a fully motion compensated conversion to uh, 25i for uh, Europe and anyone else who wants the 25. Excuse me. <coughs> Mark, do you uh, do anything with tally in terms of the cameras, number of cameras you have, or the, the opera performers looking at camera tally? Or uh, no, we. We turn off all front tallies. The opera performers never look at tally. Uh, we have tally on the intermission cameras so that backstage they can tell which one they should be looking at. Uh, but we have only rear tally for the opera cameras. On the uh, Zoom opera, do you have any idea how they dealt with the latency issues that were inherent in that? Yeah, it was uh, a musical dealing with um, so she had to figure out how she could write music that would be able to accommodate the varying latencies. And I really, really, really recommend that article that she wrote because it's, it's brilliant, it's a quick read, and she really got into all of the issues that were involved in it. Uh, Bob, you seem to be muted. There you go. Um, 
when you get a chance, can you send me your power, your presentation so I can post it along with the recording of this meeting on our website? Uh, sure. And, and, you know, and, also, and also the link that you're referring to just now that you think people would, would enjoy it looking at. Yeah, those are all available already at bit.ly slash opera hyphen pandemic. Any chance of getting an email that has that? <laughs> sure, no problem. Okay. But you have my email, I think. I'm sorry? I think you have my email. Uh, why don't you send it to me just in case? Okay. All right. Or if you that. can't get enough of you, send them to the YouTube of your, uh, your Library of Congress presentation. <laughs> yeah. Mark, I, I, I just am awed by how, how all these are, are going, Mark. I'm sorry? I'm just awed by how much info you cram into such a short time and how you change it so often. Yeah. Well, I keep learning new things. Well, the opera keeps going. Yeah. I was always amazed that way about your articles and your column in, in videography, too. And Schumann Cafe. Yeah, when I did my first column in videography, I was kind of pleased with it. And then I figured, okay, I've just written everything I know. What am I going to do next? <laughs> and when was that? That was uh, the first of 33 and a third years of columns. <laughs> I was never disappointed by one of them. They always had Thank so much information packed into them. Well, now, wait a minute. So you only started that in the 70s, in the 80s? Uh, 1976, April 1976. And in fact, the um, Oxford English Dictionary lists videography magazine as the source of the word videography. Really? <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I'm a Mark, it's a great, you great presentation, you Mark. Mark. Very, very good. You mentioned that you're switching to some radio mics. Um, just wondering, I mean, I realize opera singers are really belting it out. The sound pressure levels must be extremely high. Um, where are you placing the mics? Are they up in the hair or? Uh... Uh, we we kind of leave that to the wig people to figure out the best place to put the capsule. Um, but uh, since you mentioned radio, you know, we have a an extraordinary wireless coordination issue because uh, not only do we have the radio mics, but the stagehands are all on uh, radio intercoms, and um, there are other radio systems. Security is using radio, um, and one of the things we do in the intermissions, there's typically a prompter uh, on a stick that someone is holding, and we would love to make that wireless, um, but just coordinating a frequency band that will always be good for the stage to make the prompter wireless, we have not been able to do yet. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like the stories we used to hear about frequency jamming at football games. Yeah. And, you know, it's real safety issues. There was one show that we were doing, uh, it's the last of the ring operas, Gutter Dammerung, it's one of the longest operas that there is. And uh, the world ends at the end of it. And in this particular production, when the world ends, uh, giant things start falling down on stage. Now they're made of foam, but still, if it's something that's 100 feet long and it's made of foam, it's got some weight to it. And uh, there are these eight foot sections of stage on the main stage of the Met that can go up 10 stories or down three stories. And you can actually have a whole set of an opera and lift it up or in some operas you can perform uh, up and down on different stages. Uh, well, as part of this end of the world, one of the uh, pieces of stage was supposed to go down and it did. Um, and this whole sequence was supposed to be started at a certain cue and a stagehand asked on the intercom shortly before that started said, uh, you know, uh, are we doing this thing that we talked about this afternoon? And somebody said, no. And somebody else heard that as go and started the sequence early. And one of the singers, one of the main singers, Hildegard Behrens, 
um, who was not only a singer, but also a lawyer, um, <laughs> was uh, walking on the stage at that point and the eight foot section of stage went down, but the lights were dark and there was some fog or something and she couldn't see anything and she would have fallen into that section of eight foot stage, except that she was knocked flat by a piece of the foam that came crashing down, uh, saving her life. <laughs> And she decided not to sue us. <laughs> Mark, the, the only production I ever saw, The Phantom of the Opera, was uh, here in Las Vegas. And I was just kind of, well, I don't know if, whether you've, you've, you've seen it, but I'm just curious to know how that, that opening of the uh, assembly of the chandelier and the transformation from the cobwebs to a, you know, a, a, a vibrant, uh, clean, you know, opera house, whether that was, you know, pretty, was it, was that unusual? Uh, was that common in some of the more elaborate productions? I, it just, it, it just amazed me that the, the, the visual representation of that. Well, you, you saw what could happen at Drottning Home in 1766 and uh, even a hundred years before that uh, with uh, Giacomo Torelli. Um, so there's been a lot of stagecraft that's been used for a long time. I have a question for you. Uh -huh. uh, there, sometimes I've seen some operas actually at the at the Met. Uh -huh. The lighting wasn't that great. Do you have the ability to uh, change it for the HD opera? Yes. Um, the uh, the general manager of the Met is the big boss. He's the CEO, if you will, uh, Peter Gelb, and. Um, he can ask for anything he wants, and he's very interested in the HD Live, but he is also conscious of what's going on in the house. And um, so if there's something he sees in the HD rehearsal that he wants changed, he'll bring that up at the lighting meeting and say, can we do this, that, and the other thing? And the lighting people will generally say yes, but sometimes we'll say, but that's gonna make it look terrible in the house. And then he'll make a decision whether to go for what looks good in the house or what looks good on the HD. Mm -hmm. Or some compromise. But more often than not, it's something that people just weren't thinking about when television came in. So it might be some corner of the stage where something happens that's dark and they just weren't expecting to light it, but they can light it. I got a personal question for you, Mark. Mm -hmm. With your short beard now, where do you put the microphone and what microphone are you, are you using tonight? Is it just in your Logitech or other camera? Yeah, I'm just using the, the microphone in my computer. I do. Another question. I have another question. Um, Go you you had mentioned Charles. Peter Gelb before, uh -huh. and I was curious as to whether Peter Gelb has made uh, an offering to the orchestra because we had been reading for weeks and weeks and weeks that there was some problems between him and the orchestra. Yeah, well, it's it's a problem um, that goes beyond between him and the orchestra. The, the Met has been closed since March of last year and is not opening until September. That's 18 months without money for anybody. And the uh, question is, what gets done about it? And the Met has offered some things, uh, health coverage or something like that, and some small amount of money. Um, the orchestra wants other stuff, and it's a typical negotiation. Can't you go to Mike Bloomberg? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're going to everybody they can. Right. Mark, another question. In one uh -huh. of the pictures you sent me to do the uh, the promo, mm -hmm. uh, there was this picture of the Met at the Alexandria Palace. It was, oh, uh, they were doing the drive-in opera. The drive-in opera. Could you talk a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Uh, I showed the San Diego one, um, but basically the same thing. It actually turned out to be the same opera. It was La Boheme in both cases. Um, the English National Opera uh, set up at Alexandra uh, Palace and uh, did an outdoor drive-in opera. Again, same kind of thing, FM going to the 
uh, car radios, giant screens for seeing what was on stage if you couldn't see it from where you were parked. Yeah. And uh, it was a way of doing an opera performance. The first company, I think, to do um, a sort of drive-in opera was Berlin. And they did it on the loading dock of the opera house. And as many people as could fit in front of the loading dock in their cars could be there. The performers were outdoors on the loading dock and people watched it there. And then uh, Michigan Opera did something in a parking structure um, near the opera house. So it was semi outdoors. You know, it's one of those parking structures that doesn't have walls, uh, but it does have ceilings and there were performances in there. How long would the run be, a week, two weeks? Gee, I don't know, sorry. That's a, that's a big thing to put on. Yeah, a lot of opera companies have been doing a, a lot of stuff. It's amazing. Uh, this summer, Glimmer Glass in uh, Cooperstown is moving their entire operation out of their opera house and onto their lawn. They're building a stage outside. They're going to have these uh, separated areas where people can bring their low beach chairs and sit in them and uh, just have to hope the weather's gonna be nice. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was My absolutely pleasure. fantastic. It really thank was. You thank you very much. And I think I will turn it over to Marty. Thank and you. I'll second that and say it always is when we have you, Mark. It's just a pleasure, and uh, you're you're a font of knowledge in our industry. And uh, I we have to think up. Uh, I hope there's a next time soon, and we have to think up another good program. Uh, you have so many to choose from. Are you, are you what are you working on? Are you working on any new ones right now? Uh, well, I I wouldn't mind doing something on um, the origins of the newscast and the sportscast. I gave you some bare information about that, but there's lots more. Um, and then there's some interesting things going on in AI, uh, like not having to dub anything anymore, but just have your actors speak whatever language it is that you're going into and with full emotions and so on. And um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with human AI, they're doing this dance thing called Sway. Uh, it's an app for your phone and you can dance like any ballet dancer or any hip hop dancer uh, just uh, applies their moves to your body. Yeah, there's an awful lot going on. In fact, the uh, the chroma key without chroma is quite interesting. It, yeah. I'm probably using it right now. Yeah. <laughs> and it's getting better. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, Another thing, I don't. Have you ever done anything on on Sesame Street as far as what uh, what those years were like? I mean, that would be an interesting, an interesting topic. How that all got rolling and uh, what it was like. Yeah, my favorite story on Sesame Street. Um, you may remember the years before the SCH standard, oh, um, yeah. and. Uh, Vital had come out with the first uh, picture manipulator. This was slightly before Quantel. It was called the Squeeze Zoom. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was um, videotape recorders had to lock to whatever the subcarrier was that was on the recording uh, and then lock to whatever the house sync was. And if the recording didn't match what the house sync was, then um, the black borders of the picture got bigger and they got bigger and they got bigger and they got bigger. And um, eventually the horizontal blanking interval might even encroach into the visible area in home TVs, uh, but there was nothing anyone could do about it. And so nobody cared about it. And then Vital came out with the squeeze zoom and suddenly the FCC said, ah, we should now start enforcing the limits on um, the uh, horizontal blanking interval. And so they sent some stuff out and for all new things, when the SCH standard came out, the subcarrier to horizontal phase standard, uh, everyone matched that and all new recordings were fine. But Sesame Street went back to 1968 in recordings. And so 
Um, there was going to be a problem if you put on some old thing that had been re-recorded and the horizontal blanking interval increased. And so I got a call from the head of quality control at PBS. And he said, uh, we can't air Sesame Street because the horizontal blanking interval is too wide. And so I started thinking quickly and I said, okay, I guess you can't air Sesame Street. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean we can't air Sesame Street? We have to air Sesame Street. I said, okay, now that we understand each other, let's try to figure out what to do. It seems to me, you might remember this. I think the maximum blanking width that the FCC would allow is 11.44 microseconds. Perfect. I, hey, I got it. <laughs> All of that knowledge doesn't do me too, too much good today. Uh, which brings me to the next subject, and that is next month. Uh, we're having Carl Kuhn, and you probably know Carl. He's a two-time SIMPTE governor and um, a longtime presenter uh, in his day job for Tektronics, which is now, I guess, merged with Telestream. So it's Telestream and Tektronics. And, but he's going to be covering um, some of the new IP uh, material, particularly relative to ST2110 and uh, ST2059, uh, which relates to the IEEE 1588. It's all about pre uh, precision time protocol. And um, it will be technical, so put on your technical hats. But uh, he'll, he does a great job on that stuff. And, uh, and I, I just want to show you something I've worked out for lip sync that, is, that really works very well and it's very economical. <laughs> <laughs> so once again, thank you very much, Mark. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again and we'll get you on our website so people can watch this at their convenience. Well Thanks done. And have a good night. Well done. Yep, we'll thank you, Mark. Else.